It is uh, uh, truly an honor to be with you this evening. It's an honor to have been with you this afternoon. And I'm so pleased uh, for the Institute, uh, its mission, and the direction that it is helping pull uh, the rest of us. Tonight, uh, I'm going to ta tell you about uh, two stories and perhaps offer you to think about a third. The two stories that I want to talk to you about uh, begins uh, with the events that are separated in time by 78 years, a lifetime. But they are both intimately tied together, intimately tied together what, in, in a way that has brought us together today and tomorrow. And both star stories are from my state, Iowa. The first occurred on uh, April 27, 1933, in the depths of the uh, Great Depression, which devastated uh, the country in many ways, including its agricultural economy, and it produced many, many foreclosures throughout our state. One day, on April 27th, a group of angry men, many of them farmers facing the very foreclosure I mentioned, stormed the courthouse in Lamar's, Iowa. They confronted the judge who was on the bench, Judge Charles Bradley, whose docket included mortgage foreclosures. The men filled Judge Bradley's courtroom and they demanded, they demanded that he stop signing the foreclosure orders. Judge Bradley explained to the angry men that it was his duty to sign the orders. They again demanded that he stop and he again refused. The men grabbed him and dragged him from his courtroom into the city square. There, they again demanded that he stop signing foreclosure orders. He again refused. The men, some wearing bandanas over their face to hide their identity, pushed him to the ground and kicked him. They pried open his clenched teeth with a screwdriver and they poured alcohol down his throat. They threw him into a truck, drove him to the outskirts of town, and declared there that he had be hung. Once at the outskirts of town, the men blindfolded Judge Bradley and indeed placed a rope around his neck formed in a noose. Again, they demanded that he stop signing foreclosure orders. Again, he refused. They poured grease over his nearly naked body and pulled the rope taut around his neck. He was list lifted off the ground repeatedly until he fell unconscious. The editor of the Lamar's newspaper was in attendance. And at that point, he warned the men that they would all be charged with murder if they would, did not relate, relent. With that, the mob dispersed. Judge Bradley was not in his courtroom the next day, but another judge was. Another judge was in his courtroom to carry out the rule of law as Judge Bradley had been doing. The incident made national news at the time, yet it remains an important story for us today. For on that day, April 27, 1933, Judge Bradley, Judge Bradley could not have done more, could not have done more to uphold the honor of our system of justice in the face of public attacks against judicial authority and the rule of law. And his actions could not have better described nor better memorialized an important aspect of judicial independence, that judges do indeed 
make decisions in every case based on the rule of law and the facts of the case, not popular opinion. This is the very goal of our judicial system. And as I said to our legislature in January, a goal that is clearly embodied in the oath that every judge takes and embodied in our rules of ethics that guide every judge. And it is a precept that explains the very foundation and the strength of us as a nation in big and small ways and in ways that sometimes we don't even stop to consider. Let me just give you an example. Three years ago, about three years ago, the World Bank did a study in an effort to try to determine the wealth of a country. Why is it that one country can achieve such great wealth and another country with all sorts of natural resources simply continues to exist as a third world country? Well, the study found that the wealth of, an, uh, of, a, of a country is not a product of its natural resources, but it's a product of its intangible resources. And most importantly, among the intangible resources, without comparison, the most important is the strength and the fairness of its court system. When a country has a court system that makes fair and impartial decisions and imply, applies the rule of law equally to everyone, that is what drives the wealth of a nation. That is what allows businesses to want to invest uh, into a country. And that is what judges in this country do every day. And that what is accounts for the wealth and success of this nation. There is, however, another aspect of judicial independence that helps explain our greatness, only in a different way. Judicial independence also relates to the independence of our judicial branch to maintain our fundamental rights and liberties from intrusion by the other branches of government. This aspect, this aspect of judicial independence relates very much to the very story of the history of our country and its long search for a more, more full and complete understanding of its values, a history as we, as we well know, which is both proud and is both sad. As James Madison wrote in the Federalist Papers, number 51, justice is the end of government. It is the end of a civil society. It ever has been and ever will be pursued until it be obtained or until liberty be lost in its pursuit. But judicial independence is not about independent courts working against the other branches of government or against the people, the will of the people, but it is our chosen form of government and it is the very genius of our government designed by the people. It is part of our larger checks and balances that ensures that our rights and our values as a, as a country are retained over time. Yet as we all know that this aspect of judicial independence has not always been understood in this manner except perhaps in retrospect when we are able to look back and see and understand the value and the wisdom 
in such cases as Brown versus the Board of Education and the host of other cases signaling racial equality as well as those cases signaling gender equality that were often met with harsh criticism in their day. Each was almost always met with criticism, yet today they are embraced with great pride. It doesn't take much for us to recall, at least me, that it was many, many years following Brown that President Eisenhower was still required to send out our national troops to enforce the decision, just as President Kennedy had to do in Mississippi in 1962. And I can still remember from my grade school and junior high uh, civics books about posters and um, other signs of impeaching Earl Warren. That was the public cry at the time. And it signals that courts can and are a target of public criticism for simply doing their job when there is not a corresponding public understanding and support of its important role. And it is this observation which leads me to my second story. On November 2nd, 2010, Iowans, Iowans voted not to retain three justices of the Iowa Supreme Court largely, if not entirely, as an expression of their disagreement over a civil rights decision I authored on behalf of our court on April 3rd of 2009. That decision found that Iowa's DOMA statute violated the Equal Protection Clause of our state constitution, violated the equal protection rights of same-sex couples, to enter into marriage, that vote removed three justices from their courthouse for doing their job. And as in my first story of a judge being removed from his courtroom, the event made national news. But unlike the first story, the public action involved in this story was lawful. And it was orchestrated by a variety of groups who were heavily funded from money outside of our state for many, many reasons, including an attempt to influence future judicial decision making. It was not just a voice of criticism over a case, but an attack against the very fibric, fiber of our constitutional form of government and the very core of our democracy. We in Iowa did not see the result of the retention election coming until it was too late to do anything about it. Instead, we simply put too much faith in the existence of a public understanding of what courts do and the important judicial independence that it needs to operate and perform its job. Now as with the first story, three new justices have now been put into place and our work as a court has continued, but not without much disruption much damage, and more importantly, a looming potential for more damage from an upcoming retention election next fall, a danger that has clearly been signaled by the rhetoric of early presidential politics emanating from our Iowa caucuses. While the independence of courts has always engendered some historical tension Many factors today have emerged to elevate this to an unparalleled concern. 
These factors, I believe, include a general erosion of public confidence in all government, often giving judges two strikes before they even step to the plate, an increasing inflammatory and polarizing public discourse, which has the effect of minimizing critical thinking, an abundance of misinformation about courts and about judges, and the ease in which misinformation can be disseminated today in our society. An increase in court cases around the country involving decisive social issues. And no state should think that they're immune from what occurred in Iowa. There is a failure, a failure of schools to teach civics, to give people an understanding of the important role of courts. The Fordham Institute did a study very recently, I don't know if you've seen it, and Iowa, who's known for its, the strength of its educational system, received an F for the civics education that it gives its students, because we don't have civics education anymore in our Iowa school system. There is a failure of judges to stand up and speak out against misinformation. There is a growing ideal of certain people and certain groups that courts must no longer interpret the Constitution to open doors to specific rights not originally specifically intended to be recognized at the time the Constitution was written so that when judges do apply the Constitution in light of the understanding and in light of the knowledge that we have today, as judges have done for over 200 years, this ideology has given rise to popular cries of legislating from the bench, judicial activism, and even a complete denial of judicial authority. Additionally, political operatives, political operatives are beginning to orchestrate attacks against courts simply as a mean to increase voter turnout on non-judicial races, jeopardizing the very foundation of our governance simply for selfish and political gain. Even governmental leaders are openly advocating or threatening to remove judges for not following the popular majority as if it is what judges should do. You perhaps recall in 1996, after Justice Penny White of Tennessee was removed in a retention vote following a death penalty opinion in her state, the governor was asked, the governor of Tennessee was asked at a press conference if the retention vote should cause judges to start looking over their shoulder before making a decision. The governor's reply was, I sure hope so. And finally, some of the tension and some of the criticism is simply human nature. It's simply hard at times to accept change, especially change involving the need for us as individuals to examine our past belief system. So with this in mind, where do we go? Well, I think we can start with Alexander Hamilton's observation 230 years ago. He recognized at this time that of the inherent vulnerability of courts, and he emphasized the need to keep judges independent and insulated from public reprisal, especially, especially when judges are called to protect constitutional values from the encroachment of the other branches of government, to protect the rights belonging to all citizens from any oppression by the majority. But he had a solution too. His solution was to keep the public informed 
of the important role of the courts and keep the public informed of the duty of courts to ensure that the constitutional protections actually have meaning for all citizens. So the path that must be followed now is the path that we have already been given. And it requires us to educate, to advocate, to appreciate, and to contemplate. We need, we need to educate the public about the courts, about the role of retention voting, about the qualities that are sought in judges and the performance of judges through impartial evaluations. In short, we need to give retention voters the tools, the information to operate in a responsible way. We need to advocate for judicial independence by advocating to keep politics out of our court system. We all know what politics does for a court system. Every year, the United States Chamber of Commerce ranks our 50 court state, uh, our 50, uh, uh, state court systems. And each year, those states at the bottom of the list are those states that openly allow politics into their courtroom. We know what politics do. We need to become more thoughtful. We need to become more contemplative as a society. We need to consider issues as courts consider issues. And we need to remember in this contemplative approach that our beliefs at times can and do become eclipsed by our new understanding of the world around us, as history has repeatedly reminded us. Equal protection, for example, has always, always in this country been a powerful expression of equality. The iconic self-evident truth that Thomas Jefferson penned still rings so powerful today. Yet even he didn't get it right. It wasn't all men that were created equal. But it took a long time for us as a country to understand that blacks were not inferior, just as it took a long time for us as a country to understand that women were not the weaker sex. Until we did, we had an incomplete understanding of equality. In truth, in truth, rights cannot be fully understood until we are given an understanding. And once we are given an understanding, it is up to us to be willing to accept that understanding. A hundred years ago, in 1911, the Iowa Supreme Court decided a case involving the constitutionality of a statute that only allowed male pharmacists to sell and dispense drugs and products containing alcohol. In 1911, our court, our proud court, upheld the constitutionality of that statute, upheld it. The court observed in the opinion what we described at the time was obvious. We said this, that everyone knows that there are simply some tasks that are better suited for men than women. Today, a hundred years later, we know better. We know better, not because the language of our Constitution is any different, but because our understanding is different. 
And that is what has been given greater meaning to the equal protection over the years. Our past struggles in, uh, in truth are simply a part of the complete development of our constitutional law. It takes time and often, often places courts in the forefront, making them a target, requiring them to sift through the rhetoric and find the true facts. For sure, it is something Galileo understood quite vividly some 500 years ago, the greatest scientist uh, perhaps of all time, after he was sentenced to house arrest for having the audacity to tell the world that the sun was the center of the universe. So we, as a society, need to begin to seriously contemplate the important issues of the day and be willing to test our beliefs with our newfound knowledge. It is the path given to us by our Constitution, and it has led to our most proud moments of success. And finally, we need to appreciate. Appreciate why, why we have been able to develop into such a great country. Alexis de Tocqueville came to America in 1835. He marveled at what we had put together. And he observed this. He observed that the greatness of America is not, is not that it is more enlightened than the rest of the world, but it has the ability, the ability to change to correct its mistakes. That's our greatness. We must today continue to appreciate the reason for our greatness by continuing to use our enlightenment of today. At the Big Ten Championships in Ann Arbor, Michigan on May 25, 1935, Jesse Owens set three uh, records, world records, and tied one. He did it all in the span of 45 minutes. In the week leading up to that day, he had fallen down a flight of steps and he had hurt his back. While others worried that his injury would not allow him to compete, Owens remained confident that his backbone was as strong as ever and that it would carry him to success. He first tied the world record in the 100-yard dash. Fifteen minutes later, he was called to the long jump pit for his first jump. Before jumping, he went out and he placed a small stake with a handkerchief on it alongside the landing pit at a distance of 26 feet, two and one-half inches, the world record. He then took that marker and extended it to 28 to 26 feet 8 and a quarter inches well beyond the world record he then went back and he jumped and he soared and he soared and he reached his marker and set the world record we too we too in this room must now stake out our ground as Jesse Owens did in 1935. We must, have, we must step out and stake out our course, our goal, and rely upon our backbone, backbone to soar to our greatest heights and overcome what have been some sad setbacks, just as Jesse Owens did. John Wooden, the great basketball coach, wrote this, the main ingredient of stardom is the rest of the team. We, all of us in this room, are the rest of the team. We are the team that can give our court system 
its stardom as an important co-equal branch of government. Each one of us are a part of this team and we are a part of the main ingredient of our future success of our court system which depends on each one of us and the work that we do together. So this conference, this day, this evening, must be our call to action. Today, this day, is our time to write our own story of our great achievements. And today, this day, is your opportunity to ensure that our Constitution remains the pole star of justice. So let us today move forward to write this story. Write this story so that it can be said of us, as it was said of Judge Bradley in Iowa, that when it was our time, when it was our time, we too, we could not have done more to uphold the honor of our system of justice. Our country's character was not developed with ease, and it will not be preserved with ease. It's through experiences such as those that have occurred in Iowa that we can be strengthened, that we can be inspired, and the true story of our success can be written. Good luck. <laughs>